Madam Chair, members of the board, it's 2 o'clock p.m. and today is Tuesday, May 19th. My name is Brian Zumwalt. I'm the director of the county's Office of Technology and Innovation. I'll be playing the role of technology moderator for today's virtual meeting. On the panel with me is Don Crowell from the county attorney's office who will be serving as process moderator. And uh, as usual, before we get started, I'd like to do a quick roll call and ensure we've got communications for each commissioner. So why don't we start with Commissioner Seal? I am here, thank you. All right, good afternoon. Uh, Commissioner Eggers. I thought you muted us, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm here, good afternoon. All right, good afternoon, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Welsh. I'm here, Brian. All right, Commissioner Long. I'm here. Commissioner Justice. Good afternoon, Brian. All right, good afternoon. Commissioner Peters. I'm here, Brian. All right, and Commissioner Gerard. And good afternoon. All right, looks like we have a quorum, Madam Chair. I'll turn the meeting over to you now. I'm going to call this meeting to order. Um, let's start this meeting with a moment of silence. Okay, thank you. Um, we have one public hearing this afternoon, and that is a uh, ordinance relating to vessel exclusion zones. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Burton. Uh, agenda item one is a proposed amendments, um, a proposed ordinance amending section 130-107 of the Pinellas County Code related to vessel exclusion zones. The public hearing was properly advertised. The affidavit of publication has been received for filing. No correspondence has been received and the matter is properly before the board to be heard. Okay. Does anybody need a presentation on this? Okay, any questions? Yes, Commissioner Justice. I don't, I don't need a full presentation, but I think it'd be good if they could just show the map on and uh, where that zone is between the sand, that kind of lagoon, so people are clear about that. Yeah, Paul Cosby's on the line. He certainly uh, can provide that and provide the um, information you're requesting. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Um, Brian, if, if you don't mind, could you start the uh, presentation? Yes, it's sir. only a few slides and we can go through this pretty quickly. Okay. Um, as I said, the public hearing today to amend the ordinance uh, that establishes vessel exclusion zones at Fort DeSoto Park in order to provide for uh, our swim zones. Next slide, please. Swim zones have been previously established by ordinance at Fort DeSoto Park under authority granted to the commission by Florida statutes. Next slide, please. This ordinance was last updated in 2008. Uh, the vessel exclusion zones relating to swimmer safety at Fort DeSoto Park include a combination of vessel exclusion zones and combustion motor exclusion zones. Vessel exclusion zones, by definition, prohibit entry of all watercraft, both motorized and non-motorized, including kayaks, canoes, and paddle boards, and combustion motor exclusion zones apply to all watercraft powered by internal combustion motors, but allows for kayaks, canoes, paddle boards, sailboards, and other non-motorized craft. Next, best, uh, next slide, please. Uh, this map shows the current vessel restrictions in place, starting from the uh, red rectangle on your right-hand side, we have the uh, vessel exclusion zone for East Beach. As you go to your left, it's the vessel exclusion zone for the dog park at Fort DeSoto. And then we have a combustion motor exclusion zone as you head up to the north tip of Fort DeSoto Park that's in yellow. Uh, that is an area that starts near the shorebird protection area. And then we have a, an existing vessel exclusion zone 
which uh, is currently the North Beach area. However, uh, that has been impounded by the Ebb Shoal, which has been forming off of Fort DeSoto Park. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, we have an Ebb Shoal. Uh, those of you who are familiar with Fort DeSoto Park uh, probably know that this is something that's been forming for approximately the last 12 years or so. Uh, it continues to move to the west, or I'm sorry, to the east towards Fort DeSoto Beach. Um, and if it does anything like previous Ebb Shoals have done, it will eventually collapse onto North Beach. Uh, the situation, however, that we're dealing with now is that in order to get to the open water on the Gulf, you have to cross the lagoon. And that lagoon is currently being used by all types of vessels, which poses a safety hazard to swimmers and bathers at Fort DeSoto Park, North Beach. Next slide, please. So the, the Ebb Shoal itself has created an attractive nuisance. Um, as I said, we have swimmers, watercraft of all types using the same non-designated areas. Um, that also includes windsurfers, ultralight aircraft, um, which I will mention ultralight aircraft aren't something that can be addressed in this uh, particular ordinance. However, it is something that we're looking at in addition to the vessel exclusion zones. Next slide. Since a picture is worth a thousand words, uh, the video that we're about to play is a good example of the conflicts and conditions that are occurring within the lagoon area. Brian, could you press play? And this area is within that lagoon. So that is between North Beach and the Gulf of Mexico that's separated by that uh, roughly 60 some acre Ebb Shoal that uh, is known as Outback Key. You can see we've got bathers, we've got boats. We do have aircraft. And this particular video was taken last September. Um, I can tell you those conditions have not changed a whole lot. Um, the only thing that's going to uh, end this type of activity within that shallow protected area is a vessel exclusion zone. So anyways, you get, you get the idea of what's going on uh, out there right now. Um, we've got a mix of, of swimmers and vessels and certainly not a safe condition. So the ordinance before you is intended to modify the existing, existing vessel exclusion zones at Fort DeSoto Park in order to accomplish several objectives. One, prohibit the use of watercraft in that lagoon area between Outback Key and Fort DeSoto North Beach through the establishment of a vessel exclusion zone within that area, um, which in turn will allow safer passage of swimmers and bathers from North Beach to the newly created beach on the Gulf of Mexico. And it will maintain the existing vessel regulations currently in place at East Beach and Dog Beach, as well as the combust combustion uh, motor exclusion zone uh, in the shorebird nesting protection area. And we'll also eliminate an existing vessel exclusion zone area described in the current ordinance that's no longer necessary as that has become accreted with sand. So um, there, there is no waterway to, uh, uh, to deal with in that area. And finally, this last slide here shows the zones, uh, once again, starting from the right-hand side of the picture, we have the vessel exclusion zone at East Beach Swim Area, the vessel exclusion zone at the Dog Beach, um, the combustion motor exclusion zone that runs along from the shorebird, uh, protected shorebird nesting area, 
And then that will go into a vessel exclusion zone that uh, encompasses the entirety of the lagoon area, as well as allowing us to establish a swim zone on the west side of Outback Key, uh, where we will establish new swim buoys um, to allow bathers to use that area safely. And that's my presentation. Okay, thank you. Do we have questions? Uh, Commissioner Seal? Not a question, but, well, yes, it is a question, but um, I was um, up in the sheriff's helicopter on Sunday and clearly saw this as being um, frequented by lots of boaters. So how, other than the buoys, what is our plan for enforcement? And then the second question is, how have we been communicating what we're planning to do? Because I can imagine there's going to be some very upset people. Thank you. A, co a couple of points um, I should make. Um, once we have the approval of the amended ordinance or the new ordinance, uh, we will have to go to FWC um, to get the uh, signage permitted which will show that that area is a, an exclusion zone. We will also have to get uh, the buoy locations permitted, which will establish the swim zone. Um, and as far as the boaters go, one of the things we did do um, was we did keep that area along Bus Bunces Pass up to the uh, bump out at the very top of Outback Key. Boaters will still be able to beach in that area. so. We're not trying to uh, um, entirely remove boaters' ability to, to reach that area. A follow-up question then, Paul. So I'm looking at the proposed regulatory zone map, which was the last of your slides. And so in the north, the vessel exclusion zone, in blue, it looks like it does encompass on the west side of the um, Outback Key. Uh, Brian, could you go back to, uh, to that slide? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, I guess one thing I need to point out uh, specifically is the, the vessel exclusion zone. Um, this is drawn on, but the actual points um, for the exclusion zone are done by GPS because, because of the movement of Outback Key, this doesn't um, probably accurately depict where that sandbar is now or that ebb shoal. But when you look at the very top, um, right up here, this area all around to that point, if we go back up a little farther from, yeah, this area, still will allow boaters to uh, beach up there. They just won't be allowed to get inside here, inside the lagoon area. And we'll also have an area up here um, to the left of the arrow that will allow us to place the swim buoys, which will give people access uh, to the Gulf. So basically all around <clears throat> the outside of the blue lines, boaters can anchor and then access the beach. Correct. Okay, thank you. That, that clarifies it. Mr. Eggers. So how, how long did you say, Paul, that we've been using this little um, lagoon for boating, uh, just for bo folks to park their boats and, and um, get off of it and that kind of thing. How long have we been doing that? Well, it's, uh, well, first, uh, we, have, we haven't necessarily been allowing it. It's just been, uh, uh, I guess, allowed by exclusion. Um, when this first started, of course, um, Outback Key was many, many hundreds of yards to the west than where it is now. And what is happening is as it continues to migrate uh, towards Fort DeSoto Park, it's now entered the boundaries of the park. Um, and so 
it's it's creating that issue where the boaters and the swimmers are being squeezed into an ever smaller area. But it started, you know, roughly started in 2006, 2008 or so um, as a very small uh, piece of land further further out to the west. And it has grown through accretion of sand deposits. It's been extended many hundreds of yards to the south. So what is the problem that we're having other than the fact I saw some uh, some light planes in there. So if you if you just went to boats that were parked in there, what other problems are we having other than that mixture of, of, of transportation? Um, well, a major issue is at high tide, um, there is a small channel that develops and we have jet skiers and other boaters that move through that area um, at fairly high speeds while children, parents, uh, other uh, recreational swimmers and bathers are walking in that same area. So the issue is potential collision between uh, swimmers, bathers, and vessels. Well, I mean, I, we I, have you been hearing? Have you been getting lots of complaints about that? Well, we get we yes, we do receive complaints. We've seen issues where uh, people have almost been hit by jet skis, in particular. Um, there's a lot of uh, potential issues uh, depending on what happens with that formation out there, uh, but the. The, the other issue, of course, is that um, that is a designated swim beach. Um, so there shouldn't be vessels and swimmers mixing together. The problem is that where our buoys would traditionally be placed with the current zones, they would be sitting on top of that sandbar um, high and dry. So, so when you say vessel exclusion, you're talking about even kayaks and anything. Kayaks, yes. Yeah. A vessel exclusion zone is all watercraft, just like our other two swim areas, the Dog Beach and East Beach. Okay. Again, it feel like we're going overboard. Uh, I mean, it seems to me like if you wanted to make it combustion, you know, exclusion, I get that, but you know, the other is just so passive that it seems to make, seems to fit right in with the, the nature of that area. So I don't know, I mean, it just seems like we shouldn't have to go all the way on that, but just a thought. Commissioner Welch. Thank you, Madam Chair. Paul, can you speak to the seaplanes? That looks pretty dangerous. Is that legal? And how long has that been going on? Um, <laughs> Uh, the seaplanes have been going on for at least a couple of years. Um, we can't regulate seaplanes through a vessel exclusion zone. Um, however, if you if you go back to slide five, Brian, give me one sec, Paul. Sure. And I know this, this uh, picture is kind of uh, small, but the, the picture on the far right with the red boundary line, that is the park boundary um, as transferred to the county through the federal government. And- Sorry, Sorry Paul, hold on. No problem. There is already, we already have in chapter 90 that prohibits the takeoff and landing of aircraft um, on park property. So I think what, what, what we're going to need to do is to work with the county attorney's office uh, to see uh, what can be done uh, about that issue. But there's not enough room there now in order for a, a ultralight or seaplane to take off without actually 
uh, either starting or completing their takeoff uh, within the park boundary. Okay. And I'm sure you see, there's some other videos floating around on YouTube that just show even closer interaction between those yes, planes. There's this looks really dangerous. Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioner Long. Yes, and uh, I appreciate the work that you've done on this, Paul. My question more is to, uh, because I spend quite a bit of time on the water and I'm over on the North Beach a lot, who is, given that we passed this today, who is responsible for the enforcement? Since I thought I heard you say that, especially on the issue of the planes, we can't regulate that anyway. Right, the enforcement of the uh, exclusion zones would fall upon uh, both the um, uh, Sheriff's Marine Patrol as well as the Florida uh, Wildlife Commission to enforce. All right, well then that leads me to say, I don't know if uh, Sheriff Gualteri has joined us yet, but I'm curious about whether or not he's got any input on this subject matter. We'll get him on right now, Commissioner. I'll see if he's available. Thank you. Sheriff. There he is. Let me unmute you real quick. Hold on, sir. Sheriff, you might have to unmute on your side. I don't know if, there you go. Okay. I'm here. I heard some of that, so I probably need the question repeated. Well, I'm uh, Sheriff. This is Commissioner Long, and we've been listening to the presentation about the current swim zones and restrictions that we're talking about on Fort DeSoto, and we also had a short uh, presentation about the seaplanes that take off and land over there, and. My question was more of, given that this goes forward today, then, and I assumed it would be you and the Wildlife Commission that would have the regulatory authority, but since Paul already said that we can't really regulate the seaplanes, then I guess my question is, what are your thoughts on more enforcement of the beach areas on anything? Well, it, it, the reality is, is FWC has very limited resources. Uh, the majority, if not all, uh, of the marine enforcement is done by our, our marine unit down there. Um, you know, we're, we're at, at max as far as what we have the ability to do with the patrols that we have out there. Um, and, you know, we continue to, in of course, enforce whatever you all decide. Um, and I have not really explored this issue uh, in depth. I, I watched Paul's presentation, um, and really, this is the first I've heard of it. It has not elevated to me. So, do you really give you any more uh, in depth um, discussion about it? I would have to go talk to our folks out there. So, nobody brought anything to me uh, that raised any level of concern. But if your question is about enforcement, you know, our marine unit is there. Uh, that is an area that we focus on all the time down there uh, between that and the environmental lands unit, which is really all combined uh, for practical purposes. Um, but yeah, as far as the seaplanes are concerned, there was nothing we could do about that. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Peters. Um, yeah, I, now I was out with the Sheriff's Patrol last Saturday. Um, and even trying to distance the boats that if we take away that boating area, I, I'm not sure, you said they can move down to Bunces Pass, but to me that seems like you're gonna overcrowd and make that more dangerous. And every boater stays with their boat. So of course you're gonna have people in boats mixing together because the boaters don't leave their boats. They, they might take a walk around the beach, but they always stay behind their boats. So my concern is, especially after this pandemic and 50 feet distance that they used to have to keep, um, when I was out with the uh, Sheriff's Patrol, there was no room, even at Bunces Pass or anywhere else that they could go to. And I'm, I'm out there a lot, very often. And the, the seaplanes, the seaplanes, the seaplanes land 
far away from any boats and any people, and they, at a very slow idle, come in near the shore. So I, I, the seaplanes, I've never seen, whether they're at John's Pass or whether they're anyplace else, have I seen them really truly be a danger to a boater or a swimmer. Um, but I'm concerned that if you're going to take away this, and, and you made it clear that that and, and the sheriff's officer showed us how that key is getting filling in and filling in. It's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, so, you know, are we going to take it away from the boaters all the time? Or, or maybe I'm misunderstanding. Is it strictly the inside of the lagoon you want to stop the boating or outside of that? You know, if it's only within that lagoon, um, because when I've been out there and it's been crowded, especially because they had to space out and mostly because they had to space out. Have I recently seen boats within that lagoon area? And it's only because they're trying to adhere to the 50 feet apart. Um, and once that 50 feet apart, you'll see more boats tie up. And, and I don't know that that's as much of a problem. But I've got real concern that this is overreach. And if we're going to push them over to Bunces Pass, then we're going to have far too many boats down at Bunces Pass. And if we ever have to go to another ruling like we had with this pandemic, there's no place for them to go. And we already saw on the, on the other sandbars that they were getting really, really crowded. And I hate to eliminate other areas for boaters. Um, if it's just within the lagoon area, I can I can agree with this. But if it's outside that lagoon area, absolutely, I wouldn't support this. I think it would create more dangers than we have now. And Mr. So Cosby said it was all just within the lagoon area, right? Well, Paul, it doesn't say that on the picture. So I want to know, is it only inside of the lagoon area and not the outer perimeter? So the outer perimeter, there's no way to me this is just overreach and I worry about that. Yeah, going going back to thank you, Brian. Um, when you look on the outback key area up here in the upper left area, the area um, along Bunces Pass up here, boats will still be able to beach there as well as on this tip and then when you get down here to the Paul I can't see a cursor I don't know Paul, what you're talking about. Oh, Paul yeah, I, get, I gave you control of the cursor if you want to take it um, you should be able to use the pointer okay there you go <laughs> can you see me yes sir yeah. okay doke. so this area is existing north beach where all the bathers traditionally go you no longer have access to open water there now because this Ebb Shoal extends pretty much all the way down to about here. So when all of our bathers come to Fort DeSoto North Beach and park in our largest parking lot, the only way they can get to the beach is to cross this lagoon and here's where the sandy beach is. So the intent of the Vestal Exclusion Zone is to prevent boats from entering into the interior of the lagoon here, all through this area, because this is almost connecting to North Beach now and will eventually probably connect to it. It won't be an issue any longer, but for the time being, we have boaters, jet skiers, all types of vessels, coming in here um, oh, and they're mixing. Yeah. Paul, where is here? I can't yeah, see you. Uh, move the mouse again. Hold on. Uh, hold on. Let me try to get us back here, Paul. Hold on. Okay, no. All right. Do you have control of the cursor? There you go. Yeah. Okay. Within this area. Can you see my That's cursor? Yeah, that's where you don't want the boats, right? That's where you don't want the boats. Now, this area that basically extends from here to here, that those buoys, the swim buoys, will be placed out here to allow people access to the sandy beach for swimming. So motors will still be able to tie up here along Bunces Pass, as well as at the very tip up here. So Paul, to finish that question. So you have it driven, driven the blue line is driven, uh, drawn all the way outside the perimeter. 
You made it clear you want the swimming area on the on the outside of this area, but all of those bathers now I'm out there and boats can't get through that that south end of where your where your pointer is. Boats can't get through there right now. I can't walk past that, but maybe 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 a jet skier. The boats yes. are coming up at the northern side of that and not at the bottom side. And once that closes off, and, and you're right, it is really close to closing off. Um, it's hard to walk across now, but, and even the one at the north end is filling in so quickly that pretty soon you'll be able to walk across that. So that lagoon inside eventually is not gonna even have flushing capacity at the rate the sand is filling in. Um, and every one of those, you know, whether your largest parking lot is, has access to where the red lines are and they have access to the whole rest of the area within that lagoon. And every time I'm out there, the bathers don't even have a problem with it. They're all out there in force um, in all areas of the beach. So I just, I just feel that if we're forcing all those boaters to another area, they're gonna fill in in that channel where there's, you're gonna have more erosion where those, um, the sea oats have really built up big sand dunes because they're already parking there. And they're gonna start eroding that because we're eliminating where they can park. And I just think it's going to put more danger, forcing them to erode those areas of those sand dunes and to force more people at Bunces Pass. We already have problems with litter and stuff, but how are they going to stay apart? How are they going to stay safe? I, I think it's a mistake to take away boaters' access to places in which they can recreate. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Edwards. Yeah, quick question, Paul. I've asked you about the non-combustibles. Are kayaks a problem? Um, uh, inner, like going into that little inner area. I mean, if we're if we're going to allow the uh, motorized boats to go around the entire area, that bothers me that we we're not going to even allow them on the front side of that. So you effectively the only place they can go is at the north tip, um, and I do think that creates a, a problem, as Commissioner Peters was saying, but is there a big deal with allowing the kayaks to, to go into the lagoon? What, what's the, uh, I mean, I, I, you know, again, I just don't want to overreach where we don't have to. So. Sure. And, and certainly, you know, we have approximately seven miles of beach areas on, on Fort DeSoto Park. So it's not that there's a, a lack of access for kayakers, but the, the issue with the lagoon area is, it's shallow, um, especially at low tide, which makes it an ideal place for parents to let their kids splash around and, you know, play in the shallow water. They don't have to worry about the choppiness of, of, uh, of the Gulf waters and things like that. So it's popular for children, kind of like a splash park for them. So, you know, if, a paddle boarder or kayaker is not paying attention, then of course they could go right over the top of a kid. Um, and, and so that's that's the issue with with that portion. It's a um, it's a problem for our lifeguards to try to keep everyone aware and, and attentive as to what's going on in that area. They're trying to cover a very wide range of uh, activities going on there. So that would be that would be the issue um, from staff standpoint. Seems to me, Paul, that it might be <laughs> might be easier to ban swimming in that area than to ban all the vessels that are in and out of there, since it's going to be a moot point soon anyway. Um, and the and the swimmers have quite a lot of room to swim. Well, the just saying, right. The issue is getting the swimmers from the parking lot to the actual beach. They have to go through and around that lagoon. Um, so there's a lot more swimmers out there than there are boaters. Um, so I, I think that's the the issue. Is do you deal with the 2,000 swimmers and try to figure out a way to get them to the beach without going into that area. Uh, it's it, it's not 
one plus one equals two on this. Well, how tough is it to go to the south end? I mean, is it is it like deep and far? <laughs> Looks like it's right. Well, the, the get... south end and the south end is where the shorebird nesting protection area is. This area all through here. I, I, don't, see, it, I don't see your uh, your thing again. Oh, I'm your... sorry. Hold on, Paul. Let me give you a. He's got okay. it. Oh, he's got it. Uh, hold on. Go okay. ahead, Paul. Yeah. This area from about here to here. Still not seeing it, Paul. Lost it now. There you go. You're good. Shorebird nesting protection area through mm -hmm. here. So, and you've got another lagoon that is right here that you have to get across, or you have to come down and around and walk down here. So this up here, oh, lost it. this up here is the largest, can you see it? Yeah. This is the largest parking lot in the park. I believe it's 13 or 1800 vehicle parking right here. Everyone migrates to the area north of here, because here's where, one, the beach widens, it gets very narrow here. So until all of this connects and we have a much larger beach, um, that's what we're dealing with. Okay. Other questions, comments? Yes, Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, that, that north end of the parking lot, that's where you go. Um, that's where we would always go. You drive to the very end of the road to get to the north parking lot, and you could traverse through that lagoon to get to the Gulf. So all this time we've been talking about the need for more beach space to be able to spread folks out. That lagoon, I just hate for us to wait till something really serious happen. And then, you know, the next day we'd be changing the rules. So I think staff has pretty well thought this out and I'm supportive of what the staff has recommended. Yes, Commissioner Welch. Thank you. I'm going to support this as well. And I did want to also comment on, although we can't gotcha. do anything about the seaplanes, I'm going to forge all the video that was shot on May 9th and it, the planes are between the boats and the shore. And it looks like a recipe for disaster. So I'm going to send that out to everybody so you can see it. Thank, Thank you, you. Commissioner Seal. I'm going to support this too because <clears throat> I do believe um, this is, um, as Commissioner Justice said, an accident waiting to happen. And I'm satisfied that the boats can still park on the outside of Outback Key and still be able to access swimming in the lagoon. So I think it is a compromise, but it does provide for safety. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Commissioner Eggers. Yeah, again, just I want to make sure just what, what you just said, Commissioner C. I want to, I'm, I'm not hearing that you're going to be able to park anywhere on that on that west side. You're so you're so you're you're limiting them the boats to the north side of the or the tip i guess or uh, or the or the or the or the canal but not on the west side so where where are the boats going to go that you, you just said can park and access the lagoon for swimming where, where where do they go i mean i just i don't know enough about that area so well i guess i'm puzzled because when i first asked a question and paul walked us through where the line is that you would still be able to park on the west side of that line. You would anchor, correct, Paul? Yeah. Yes. First off, you can you, you can anchor. Oh. Oh. Hold on a sec, Paul. I'll get you there. There you go. Sorry. Can you see me? Oh. Now you're okay. You can beach on dry land all the way through here. You can anchor 
outside of the swim buoys along here. So all this does is provide that 100, 150 yards necessary to establish the swim beach along Outback Key out here. So it's 150 yards of course, off, 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 the, off the land? It's 100 or 150 yards. They haven't been established yet, but whatever's sufficient to allow um, the proper depth of the swimmers. Um, we generally don't put the swim buoys above people's heads. Um, the idea is that for them to be able to bathe, um, not um, dive. I'm sorry, Paul. The, are you saying that the buoy is going to be um, is 150 yards? Are you taking saying away from the shore 150 yards? Away from the shore, correct. That seems pretty far out. I mean, that's like that's like uh, almost a football field and a half. I mean, in my world, that's that's what I'm looking at. That's yeah. So that's the boats have to park on the outside of that. Right, and and I don't I don't want to. Uh to claim that it's 150 yards because we, we have to go out there and check the depth and everything. Um, you know, it depends on how gradual uh, you reach the depth of that, say six foot depth um, to get out there. So it, it, it may be um, 75 yards, maybe a hundred yards. Uh, it really depends on the water depth. Uh, yes, Commissioner Peters. Um, Paul, could you pull up that picture again? And then I want you to take that cursor around the, the inlet that goes in between the two land masses and where those sand dunes are. This inlet? Yeah, that and not that inlet. Now keep going, see right down to that. Those are all sand dunes. And the whole way down into that canal, not, not where the beaches are, but go out a little bit, stay on the outside of there. All of those are sand dunes. And because they're on, because of the 50 foot space, keep going, there's sand dunes all the way across, all the way down. So when I was out with the sheriff, because of the 50 foot rule, all of those sand dunes had boats and bathers. And when it's high tide, it's hard for them to get on that shore. And so they're eroding and taking down those sand dunes. And so what I see is if we take away that outside where it's all Gulf of Mexico and it's all wide, and we don't have sand dunes that we need to be protecting that land mass. That is, you know, long term, that makes more sense. But what I saw when I was out there is people climbing on those sand dunes, backing their boats up to those sand dunes and degrading that area for erosion. And if you take away that outside perimeter where you want to keep that that whole thing. I'm sorry, I just lost lost myself here. But if you keep taking that area away from the boaters, all I see is more boaters going on the inside of that canal area on both sides and degrading all of those sandbars on the other side of Fort DeSoto. Um, and, I, and I still believe that the more they cram in there, that was a dangerous pass. When we were going through there, there were so many boats, it was so choked up for them looking for a place to park because of the 50 foot distance range. I, I think you're asking, I, and I have not heard if there's been any accident at that beach area in recent history. I mean, even with this whole, all the boaters were out, I think more in mass during this pandemic and this shutdown than normally. And so have there been any accidents in the time that we've shut down when those, when that area is just packed and it's packed with boat boaters. I mean, I've not seen it as busy as it's been since, since the shutdown and I've not heard of any accidents over there. So I, I just feel we've taken away the ability, and I, I agree with taking away, you know, in the swim zones on the beach areas where the hotels are, but all this does is push them into the Johns Pass sandbar, push them to other areas in which they can, I just don't know that this is the right thing to do. That area is going to close up soon. You want to close just the inside of that lagoon? I can live with that, but I cannot live with the outside of that. I think, I think we're going to cause accidents if we do that and we're going to degrade those sand dunes and that whole area of that canal is going to get choked up and there will be accidents. I'm convinced of it after what I saw on um, the Saturday I was out with the sheriff. 
um, Madam Commissioner, I, I think Please. <laughs> I think the the issue is we have lost the public beach as it currently is shown. So if we are going to say that boaters are allowed in that area, then we can't have a public beach there. We will have to restrict lifeguards, swimming, guarded beaches to East Beach. And that would be what we're left with because we can't expect, we can't encourage people to swim amongst boats and other vessels. It's just not safe. So I think that's, that's the issue we're trying to tackle. We've lost what is North Beach, which of course everyone remembers was America's number one beach. Um, we've lost that by the formation of this key. So we either need to abandon it as a public bathing beach and just rely on East Beach um, as a guarded as a guarded beach, um, or we need to dramatically reduce the size of the beach, which is going to put literally thousands of people within a very confined and small area. And, and that, that's the, the purpose of trying to extend and, and replace those former, former vessel exclusion zones um, to an area that is being used as the public beach based on the natural evolution of what's going on there with the sandbar or Ebb Shoal. Okay. Anybody else? Yes, Commissioner Justice. No, I, I was just oh. saying, I think we've kind of heard the points and if you're ready, I'd like to make a motion to approve. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, we have a, a motion from Commissioner Justice, second from Commissioner Welch. Do we have um, anybody online would like to speak to this? Thank you, Madam Chair. At this time, if there are any members of the public that wish to comment on agenda, agenda item number one, uh, please raise your hand virtually in the Zoom meeting or uh, hit star nine on your phone. And Madam Chair, it doesn't appear that we have any members of the public that wish to comment. Okay. Well, thank you, then. Um, let's poll the board on this one. Uh, Commissioner Long? Yes. Commissioner Seal? Yes. Commissioner Justice? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Eggers? No. Commissioner Welch? Yes. Commissioner Peters? No. And myself is the yes. So motion carries 5-2. Right. Item. And Paul, is are there any other areas uh, that we could open to boat beaching, if you will, where swimmers, I, I mean, I understand the rationale because the parking lot is there and that's where everybody goes to swim. Is there any place we could allow boaters to be? Well, of, of course, there's certainly plenty of places where boaters are, are now. I mean, certainly I can look into that and, and get back with you, but, um, you know, the exclusion zones shown um, on the existing map show where boaters can't be, not right. where, you know, so by exclusion, there are plenty of other areas where boaters can be, um, but I'm not a boater, so I don't know what exactly they look for um, as to where they want to beach or where they want to anchor. Okay, so any place but those red zones and what we just talked about, they can come yeah. up on the beach. Yes. Okay, thanks. Um, all right, our consent agenda, items two through 11. Does anybody need to pull anything? Move consent, Madam Chair. Second. Aaron, did you have something? No? 
Okay, we have a motion from Commissioner Long, second from Commissioner Welch. Uh, do we have anyone wants to speak to the consent agenda? At this time, if there are any members of the public that wish to con speak on the cons consent agenda, please hit star nine on your phone or raise your hand virtually in the Zoom meeting. And Madam Chair, there are no speakers that wish to be heard. Okay, thank you. Uh, in that case, all in favor, please say aye, raise your hand. Aye. 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 It appears to be unanimous. Thank you. Um, item 12, Mr. Burton. Item 12 is a local state of emergency. This would extend the state of emergency from Friday, uh, May the 22nd through Friday, May the 29th. Um, since our last meeting, there's been a few updates that I can provide uh, the board regarding the state of emergency. Uh, as you're well aware, last Friday, the governor announced at that time we were in a full phase one. Um, if you go to the document titled Reopening Florida, it outlines our what phase one, uh, things in phase one that are allowed. Um, we That included um, allowing activities such as bowling alleys. You heard, you probably saw the controversy around um, the issue of movie theaters. Those are clearly outlined within phase one at 50% in the social distancing. What it really says is that we're getting into a reopening mode um, and we have to adopt practices that keep people safe. That includes social distancing as part of our daily lives. That includes uh, limiting capacity and trying to do the things that we can do uh, to make sure we can go and participate in activities, go to restaurants and things like that, but do so safely. Um, so the sheriff and I outlined on a Facebook Live kind of what that means. Um, we put that out through a um, document that is uh, published on our website and pushed out through the media. Uh, which lists out the various activities and um, the requirements for those activities. Uh, basically, then the final thing that they did is they put on that vacation rentals can open with a plan from approved plan from the county. Uh, so we submitted that plan um, and are waiting back from the Florida Department of Business and Professional Regulation for approval of that plan. Um, I emailed before this meeting hoping to get a word uh, back, and they said it's in process. They did approve seven um, from the panhandle today, um, all counties up in that area. So I don't know if they're taking them by geographic area or what. Um, he verbally told me that there was no issue, but I have not received official word on that as of the time of this meeting. So as a result of the changes that they've made and the uh, vacation rentals request, do we have to change anything in our state of emergency? No, our state of emergency is really focused around three areas, playgrounds, which I recommend you still keep closed because of where we're at, um, the social distancing on the beach and the social distancing in the pools. We've kicked this into motion at some point as part, as part of these, we could, relax that and just rely upon the state regulations regarding those. Um, but at this point, um, even from a messaging standpoint, I think it makes sense for us to keep those in place. So we don't have to take any action once the, uh, either to approve our plan uh, for the vacation rentals. We no, just wait for him to approve it and then it's a done deal. Correct, they delegated that. Um, so so the, county commit, uh, the county administrator could submit that. So I submitted that on behalf of them. In, in part because, you know, we're trying to allow them to make reservations for this weekend. And so right. even waiting another day till when we had a commission meeting um, would have added another delay to uh, them being able to get that approval. And so um, I did, you know, reach out and talk to different commissioners. No one objected. It did provide that authority to me. I submitted that, sent that a copy of to you uh, and submitted that on behalf of the county and all it, all it takes is, a, is approval by the state. Okay. Uh, yes, Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is probably a uh, ship that sailed or a lost cause by now, but um, it, as we are talking with our constituents and we're talking with folks, and I think every single news article led with county does this or county does that, right. and we didn't do any of it. Uh, for better or worse, whether you like it or hate it. Um, and so that communication of 
that this is the state's, the governor's executive order. Um, again, maybe it's a lost cause now, but as we are um, doing a press releases and we're communicating that information, I think it doesn't hurt to reiterate that this is the governor's executive order that is either opening or closing or limiting the businesses in, in the state of Florida. And you're, you're correct, Commissioner. Uh, in fact, you lifted your stay-at-home order um, a couple of weeks ago, and we are simply operating under the state order, um, except for the items that I previously mentioned. And so it's uh, we're simply implementing the uh, direction of the governor through his through his executive order. And in retrospect, I agree. I think we should have made a stronger point of that in the beginning, but that born door is closed. Uh, Commissioner Welch. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just want to congratulate staff on doing a great job responding to something that you really weren't expecting uh, over the weekend and getting that plan out. Um, it kind of befuddles me why we see this pattern of something being released, yeah, released late on Friday and the counties don't have any heads up of what's coming. So thank you for getting that out quickly. One question that I had though, Barry, on your plan, the first item, uh, vacation rental reservations, explain that, give me an example, uh, cause I can't get my arms around what that first one means. It says vacation rental re reservations from areas identified by Governor DeSantis as high risk through executive orders must be for periods longer than the quarantine period established in that order. What does that mean in layman's terms? I still can't understand. <laughs> what that means is it's guidance documents that the state had put out. They wanted actually us to limit and say that we would we would um, try and restrict reservations from high COVID areas. Um, well, you know the problem is that's not an executive order anywhere. Um, some of this has been done by you know uh, guidance documents and things like that, not executive orders. Um, we didn't require that for hotels. Um, mm -hmm. And so simply from a fairness, um, I limited the language to th say that if the governor provides restrictions on rental reservations, then the then the um, vacation rental places must abide by those. But um, but mm -hmm. restricting it only what the governor would put in writing. So you're talking about the geographical restrictions like folks coming from New York or correct. Other Okay. There, there a lot of, you'll see in a lot of the other plans around the state, and I did all we can um, coordinate with our peer counties, um, and you'll see in theirs that they uh, say that it restricts rental reservations to states that do not have a COVID um, um, infection rate of 500 per 100,000 population, um, and that 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 would eliminate about 11 states. Um, you know, we're all concerned about this spread and we're all concerned about people from coming from other areas, but that's not what we put out as a statewide guidance. That's not what we put out for hotels. And so to somehow take this segment of our population and add an additional restriction, uh, I didn't like, think was warranted. Okay. And the other thing we've all been hit on social media was, uh, as Commissioner Justice alluded to, uh, the movie theater issue where the governor gave one message, but is the documents say something else. Have we heard from any movie theaters that are actually thinking about opening in Pinellas? Uh, I haven't. I, I defer to the sheriff to see if he has, but I, I have not. And sheriff and I talk about 10 times a day, so I'm sure I would have heard about it. Okay. Um, sheriff, but, but no. I have I'd be if the sheriff has heard as well, because I haven't heard of any. <laughs> um, sheriff, you're going to have to unmute. Yeah. No, I've heard from everybody else. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, <laughs> bowling alleys and you name it. But, you know, that is no, that's one segment that uh, but it is clearly stated, Commissioner, uh, in uh, the phase one guidance. And it is clear. It's articulated. There's no ambiguity. Um, and we felt as long as we were fully implementing phase one, which is what the governor's order says, phase one in all Florida counties is fully implemented. Is, is that we just went with the literal black and white, what is there on paper. Um, and you know, I've said it before, this is unfortunate. I think we all uh, are facing this, is that some things are said and they differ as to what's on paper. And we've been consistent with going with what's on paper. Yeah. And to, you know, to, to make clear, this order was the first time we had clarity regarding it said, we are in a full phase one. Right. The state's mm -hmm. document here, 
set a outline clearly what that is. And so um, that's the way we interpreted it. We tracked every order going back to the original and tracked them forward to see if we were missing something and had about four sets of eyes on this. So um, I understand what was said. Um, I don't know what the oversight is, but um, in fact, we want to implement what is written and what it, I can point to when somebody asks why there's a restriction here and not some someplace else. We are simply trying to implement what is the written order of the governor of Florida. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and with and with the with those uh, movie theaters, is that they're still limited to fifty percent. They still have to. Right. You can't put everybody in every seat in every row. So it would be like every other row. You know, they they still have to comply. So it is. You know, make sure that anybody watching is under no misunderstanding. It's not just like everything else. Just like the beaches are not and everything. It doesn't open the doors and everybody come like usual. So there's still some pretty stringent requirements if they decided to do that. Okay. Thank you, Sheriff. Any other questions, comments? Yes, Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Madam Chair. I don't know if you were planning on, if we were gonna have a update from uh, Dr. Jamison or Dr. Cho at this point or somewhere else in the meeting or um, if they have an update to share. Not much has changed since last week, um, but they certainly, they're on the line and they certainly can provide, answer any questions that you have. Or I can give a real brief update. Um, uh, so in terms of uh, situational awareness, uh, we have, uh, as of today, 1,063 cases here in Pinellas County with 71 deaths. Uh, unfortunately, the majority do, is coming from the long-term care facilities. Um, uh, so therefore, the long-term care facilities do, does remain a top priority for us. Uh, we are blessed to have this partnership really working together on this um, patient population, including hospitals, EMS, fire, um, BCC, uh, emergency management, DOH, as well as ACA. Um, ob obviously, we're working with the facilities pretty closely uh, in terms of uh, making sure that their infection control practices are in place. Uh, you may have also seen an announcement by ACA and DOH uh, just yesterday. Uh, they're looking over the next 15 days to test all uh, residents and staff within the, those facilities um, in that time span. Uh, so we're working to coordinate. Um, in terms of community testing, we're fortunate again to have all these great community partnerships, uh, including um, uh, CHC, uh, Advent, Baycare, um, um, uh, trying to increase the uh, uh, community testing as well. So we're going to work on those efforts. And what I'll also add, uh, lastly, is that uh, any reopening has to be married with the social distancing aspect. Uh, I'd love to see more cloth masks out there, still guidance within CDC, especially for those that are in the high-risk population, the elderly and those with um, chronic health conditions. So with that, I'll stop there. Thank you. Any questions for Dr. Cho? Okay. Any questions for anybody? <laughs> yes, Commissioner Welch. Question for, uh, for Barry or Dr. Cho or maybe Lourdes on the uh the testing rollout uh how is it going um had the opportunity to visit johnny ruth clark last week um and they were kind of ramping up you know folks hadn't gotten the word that they were restocked we've received a couple of emails in fact one today uh and um council member lisa willard bowman po posted something on facebook with her experience so are they Still, you know, finding some bumps in the road, Lourdes. Do they still not need any of uh, further support from the county? Just what? How is it going out there? Well, the sure. test sites, and I'll reiterate. So we have uh, several different things going on. So we updated our website, so you can come to go to the county's website and find all of the different testing centers. That includes Bay Care. That includes the uh, Pinellas County Health Department. It also includes the nonprofits that are running various test centers. The community health centers, they're running three different sites. Um, I think that's right, there are four. Um, and, but there's been a few bumps in the roads. When we have those, we do communicate with the CEO of the nonprofit. Uh, they've been very responsive to trying to fix and address any issues and shortcomings within their testing protocols uh, or their you know, administrative protocols on how they accept people and uh, conduct those tests. Um, so we're continuing to work with them. We're, we're advocating or, or doing the outreach for them to make sure people are aware. Um, but, and then we just try to work with them. They do have, I haven't heard about an issue of shortage. And in fact, you can see on our uh, website that there are more tests 
than there is a demand uh, currently. And so that is, um, so we do have capacity within the testing centers. There's another testing site that is going to be established uh, at Advent up in uh, North County that, um, however, it's been delayed. It was going to begin this week, and I guess they're running into some issues. And typically, it's not the issue of, um, of the tests themselves, but of, of the tests, uh, getting the test results of so the labs. And, and that's what they ran into with the Advent site. And so that's been a delayed and it won't begin until next week. As we get closer to that time and we know that it's actually going to happen and all of the uh, procedures are, and the materials in place, then we'll, then we'll push out and, um, and, and let people know about that additional site. And we've gotten real, really good feedback, Madam Chair, on the, um, on the website that the county put up. A lot of folks are thankful to see the information in one place, Barry, so kudos on that. Uh, we are getting some feedback on wait times on phones and understand that they will run separately from the county, but we're still getting that feedback. So hopefully we can pass that along. We, we certainly will. We've offered assistance. They've said, and they, but they've made the changes similar to any kind of new thing that you're doing when you're doing mass and you're not used to running sure. mass sites, but, um, um, but they, they assure us that they're resolving those issues. And again, we thank them for stepping forward. Um, my last question, Madam Chair, um, to Dr. Cho, perhaps, you know, part of the, what we're hearing is it takes four or five days to get the test results back. Do you see that shortening as we move forward with um, better testing technology or is that four to five day wait going to be what we expect? I'd like to think that uh, where I think the community, I think the private vendors and the hospitals are, are working to try to shorten that. Um, I, I think if you use some of the private labs out there, I think that is around the the turnaround. I know uh, other hospitals have developed quicker capabilities, uh, but there is a limit because uh, there's um, uh, within the lab machines that they have certain reagents. So what we're looking to do, and we're going to have further discussions uh, this week, is uh, seeing what we can do to uh, have uh, these rapid tests and quicker turnarounds. Uh, so hopefully that will be more available in the near future. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Cho. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Commissioner Eggers. Just a couple, just a couple questions, maybe a couple comments. Um, Dr. Cho, do you see any of those pop-up sites being established in the the Greenwood area um, uh, 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 of, of Clearwater or any other area in North County? So, uh, just uh, background: we've been working with various jurisdictions to do these pop-up sites, uh, mainly geared towards uh, transportation uh, disadvantaged sort of areas. Um, we've done two in St. Petersburg to date. Uh, we are working on a third one with Pinellas Park, and then I, I believe we are in the very preliminary stages of having that conversation with Clearwater as well. Okay, yeah, the, um, the Barry updated the, um, the Advent Health. I had a chance to meet with their, their CEO today at lunch, and um, obviously they're very anxious to get this up. They did have some problems with a lab out in Texas that was a uh, was created a lot of issues right away when they were ready to roll out and uh, so their executives flew out there to put eyes on the on the site and decided immediately to cancel that contract and that's what delayed that coming forward and they felt terrible about it but they're ready to go uh they're going to let this week they wanted to calm the, the waters a little bit but they're ready to go they have a new lab to do two a two to three day turnarounds um i think dr cho mentioned the rapid turnarounds which they do provide I think they've used them in some of the um, the uh, nursing homes when they go in to try to, to try to get a handle on what's going on in the nursing home. But for the most part, that those cases, those testing is, I guess, two to three days will be available out at the site. So they're certainly hoping to get that. Not hoping, they're committed to getting that up next Tuesday. Is what he told me. So again, um, he you know passed his. Um, sorrows that he didn't get it out there you know, like he had hoped, but you know, they got to do it right. And, uh, and they figured they better slow it down and get the right group in place to do the right results. So anyway, um, so I thought that was good. And um, I think just continuing to look for some of these pop-up sites, I think is a good thing and getting the message out there that where, where we can, where folks can go and get tests. It's been a little bit of an inconsistent message. And again, I'm not, I'm not, critiquing us. It's been partially in the product that's been available. So I just think uh, there are a lot of people who probably are, are somewhat confused still about how they can get testing and what the cost is and all of that. So uh, I think as we continue to do that, we'll continue to get more testing. Um, 
And uh, is, are you going to have a presentation later on the CARES program, Barry? Yes. Okay. Um, and um, and on the uh, on the website, I was looking. Thank you, um, Barbara, for getting that website going uh, on the data. Um, I was looking for percent positives. I was looking on my iPad, so uh, maybe it didn't pick that up, but um, I did not see the percent positive new cases, percent positives on there. And I was wondering, if, 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 is that something that we plan to have um, uh, versus, um, or is it just not available? Um, that's a problem of having consistent data um, out of the state. And so that is something we reported on before we had deduplicated data, if you recall how we, we, we were struggling with, it was, was it 5% or was it 2%? Well, that was because of deduplicated data. We've gotten inconsistent reports out of the state on that information. So we're looking at that um, before we put that up on our website. I wanna make sure that it's consistent and we have confidence in the data. Well, it's one thing, uh, yeah, we should have confidence for our decision-making for sure. Uh, and you wanna obviously have it right before we go you know, public with it. but. Um, you you feel like you have the raw data to, to get the information is just no. sorting through it or you don't no, even this, have this it? is this is state of Florida information so the only information we have is what the state of Florida reports and so we're extracting it from them and because we were getting the, some inconsistent information we we put that piece down we when I originally reported to you if you recall a couple weeks ago that's where we had deduplicated data in other words somebody comes in they're in that side that 14 day period they get tested three times well and the aggregate data, each one of those would count as a positive test when in fact it's one person. We were able to de deduct that information. We simply can't get that information right now. Um, and so we're trying to find out, is that something where, so we may have to report just the total positives. It's gonna be a, it's gonna be a higher number and it's, gonna, and, and it's not gonna really reflect it because of multiple tests. But that's a, a data problem that we've had and so that's something that we're looking into further before we put that up on our website. Well, I certainly think that that's one of those very important numbers to be tracking. So whether it's at the state level or here locally, boy, that just seems really an important piece that we're missing. And, yeah. you know, as our residents, as we start to go forward here, they're going to be looking at things. And for me, that, so because that number, you can still have more testing. The cases go up, but the percent positives go down. So there's a lot. There's a lot in play in those numbers, so. And uh, Charlie, would you get a hold of your dog, please? Um, thank you, thank you, uh, Barry. Appreciate it. Barry. Barry, can I comment on that? Yeah, go ahead, Dr. Cho. So uh, we'll definitely continue to look at that through the data group, uh, but um, uh, and I'll refer this to the, the county-specific report. They have deduplicated it since, so you can see uh, on the county-specific report the percent positivities that are unique, so that meaning that they took out the duplicated clients. So take a, a look, uh, like for example, on the 18th, that does show uh, a po percent positivity of 1.3%. You can sort of see the last 14 day trends from there as well. And that's on our website? Uh, it's, it's, it's on the DOH uh, county specific report. And I, I'll, uh, again, I'll, I'll make it sure that, uh, or we'll work together to make that a uh, link there if we need okay. to. So if we, can, if we can link that, we'll absolutely link that. Okay, okay great. Commissioner Seal and then Commissioner Long. Uh, yes, okay, so we are talking about CARES later, so I'll hold off on that. But I did want to bring up, um, I, I, well, first of all, I also want to echo Commissioner Welch. The website is excellent, and it's nice to have a place where citizens and businesses can go to one place and get factual information. Um, very easy, very well done, so thank you, Barbara, and uh, the rest of the team. And... Um, also, I do think our plan for vacation rentals is excellent as well. So can, uh, thank you, Barry and team. Um, so in observing both from the air and on the ground, one of the concerns that I have is water side at the beaches and also sidewalks on the beaches. And the social distancing is not taking place in many cases, and I am concerned about that. I know it's nothing we can regulate, um, except for the chair of reminding people, but I didn't know whether there was a fun way of putting a message out there, like on a beach, wear a swim noodle that's six feet around you so that when you're walking somewhere that the swim noodle reminds everybody to 
to stay their distance and separate. Um, just a thought. I am, again, really concerned about that. I was on Mandalay and it got choked up and I was like, I'm done. I am turning around and leaving because this is not a safe situation. Um, the other was I was on the Visit Florida um, webinar with Dana Young. And, um, you know, there's a real push as we start to welcome back tourists to um, have them visit locally or have them visit in the state within the state of Florida. And I do see this as a um, when you look at the zones that they've established to visit Florida, obviously we're in the same zone as Hillsboro. So I'd like to see how much um, cooperation there is between doing some kind of co-op advertising campaign between Visit St. Pete Clearwater and Visit Tampa Bay. And you don't really have to answer that now. It's just an idea that I think would um, be fruitful for all of us as we um, start to reopen back up. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Long? And I'm technology. Sorry, so I'm going to temporarily go over and see if I can fix. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. In the spirit of full disclosure, Commissioner Eggers, that was not Charlie's dog, it was mine. <laughs> the men are mowing the yard and the dogs are going nuts. So please forgive me for that. Um, I, do, I did want to just make a point, though, about the conversation we were just having about the way in which our numbers are going up. And I think it's really, really important and critical how we message ourselves going forward because we were worried about that anyway as we moved to start reopening the county with our businesses. And now that there's a focus on bringing our tourists in and we're coming up on Memorial Day weekend, to Commissioner Seal's point about being really strong on the social distancing and the wearing the masks and things like that, washing our hands, to me just makes enormous sense. I am very sensitive to the data that we're getting from the state. And quite frankly, given the things that are going on there within the state agencies and the, the press releases we've seen of, of date about some of the data and how it's been manipulated and or deleted, makes me very uncomfortable. And so um, I just think we have to be really careful and really monitor closely how much these numbers continue to go up. And I, I, do, I did have this conversation with Barry just a few days ago about when we talk about those numbers, those aren't current numbers of people who are sick, who have Test. I mean, all of the people from the beginning are lumped into that thousand plus number, correct, Barry? Well, the number is always going to go up because each each case, you know, each day goes up. But as a percentage no. of the top, go, go ahead. My, my point is we never take anybody off that has gotten better and is no longer in our quote unquote healthcare system. So I think that's important, too, because we don't really track how many people have gotten sick but are better. And, and I think that's a good positive well, that, message. Yeah, it, it is. And, and again, it's, it's very difficult. We struggled with this on our data group and trying to get accurate information out. As you know, the information we get is the percent positives, the number of positive tests. Those are not reported to the county. They're reported to the state. And yes. so we're relying upon the state to provide that type of information. What is more difficult is then to extract out people that are when somebody goes into a window and then they get better and they're coming out of that window to know how many people inside that window at any one time. And how does that reflect as a trend line in terms of what's occurring within the overall population group? Um, that's a piece that we're still working with. We wanted to get this up and running. Um, but, you know, there's a couple of other data points, Commissioner Eggers' point, that we'd like to put in 
Um, and so we'll continue to refine that. What we do know is that we still see that percent positive and the number of tests being fairly low. It was higher last week. We tested a lot of nursing homes and we had a large population group of nursing homes that had um, a significant positive test group. Um, so that, that impacted the overall numbers. And it was a time where the numbers, the number of people we tested went down for that day. So in that one particular day that went up, but as an aggregate, it's still in that two to 5%, um, you know, and then we also added the, the hospital data to show that whether we're, you know, getting close to capacity or not. Um, so those are the types of data we'll continue to track, we'll continue to report to you to where we can use that information to have an informed conversation when we meet. So Barry, I was thinking it might be um, important to make the connection somehow between the number of cases and the number of positives because we know we're going to see the number of positives go up because we're testing yeah. a whole lot more and i'm well, not sure how i mean other than the percent positive if we can't get a reliable number on there can we, we either put those two numbers in proximity with each other <laughs> the number of tests and the number of new cases we do have that comment. information um and so um, we, so I'm, I'm just, I'm actually going to our, you know, website and I, I know they worked on this until they got that out last night. Um, uh, and we do have the number, the daily number of positive tests. Um, and so your question is the, per, is the percent positives. And we do have that information. And, and so I'll have to look at where we, how we can uh, show that as a percentage of the number of people tested. Yeah, well, either that or and if we don't think that number is going to be reliable because the numbers come from different places, can we show the number of tests, you know, that we're having maybe even on the same graph as the number of new cases? So it's clear that there's a correlation between the number of tests you do and the number of new cases you're going to identify, whether right. those people are symptomatic or not. Because yeah. we are doing tests now on people that are asymptomatic. That's okay. correct. We, anyway. we we can't we we absolutely can can work on that piece. So <laughs> just, just a thought. Go ahead, Dr. Cho. So uh, and again, I'll refer you back to the county specific report from the state. Uh, it does have that bar when they look at the percent positivities. They give you the the because the denominator is going to be the total number of tests that day, and then they have the, over the positive. So you can sort of see that. Um, and I'll, sh I'll share it with the commissioners uh, just so that uh, we're on the same page. Uh, but uh, just to comment on some of the, the, the trends and the numbers that we're monitoring uh, from our standpoint, uh, I think case count's important, but also the trends over the last seven to 14 days. That percent positivity, uh, as everyone's mentioned, uh, is also an important thing to monitor, but also syndromic surveillance. This is looking for things like cough and fevers and shortness of breath within in the emergency rooms, because that might be an early indicator. Um, and then lastly, uh, because the idea of the flattening the curve was always to look at hospital capacity. So looking at ICU bed and uh, vent availabilities, I think are important. So those are some of the key features that I'm sort of uh, tracking on our end. So I, Barbara sending me a frantic you know, text saying <laughs> the part of the issue is some of the information they have out they have out on a PDF. And so our ability to convert it again. So we're going to have to figure that out. It's not an, it's, it's not, that isn't something I can link to. That'll be in a, and a format that we can publish out on our website because of the issues that everyone knows. So we'll have to we'll have to work on how to convert that over and keep that up to date. All right. Well, tell her not to get frantic over it. <laughs> um, okay. Any any other questions? I guess if we beef this up enough, we can uh, entertain a motion. This is about extending our local state of emergency. <laughs> Uh, did you already take comment? Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, but do we have some comments on the line? At this time, if there are any members of the public that wish to comment on this agenda item, please hit star nine if you're on the telephone line or uh, raise your hand virtually in the Zoom meeting. And uh, Madam Chair, we do have two members of the public that wish to be heard on this item. Okay. Uh, our first speaker is coming in on the phone line, last four digits, 7561. 
If you'll give us your first and last name, spelling, address, and you'll have three minutes to address the board. Hi, my name is Dan. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, ma'am. You're you're really really breaking up. Can you try calling back in? Is that better? No, it's it's not better. Can you try calling back in, and uh, we'll try getting you back on as a speaker. Uh, go ahead and raise your hand again, hitting star nine. Call back in, and we'll try to get you with the next uh, with the next slot here. Uh, Madam Chair, our next speaker is John Lannon. Uh, Mr. Lannon, if you'll go ahead and give us your first, last name, spelling, address, and you'll have three minutes to address the board. Uh, John Lannon, uh, address 24546 U.S. 19 North in Clearwater. I'm the general manager here at Celebration Station. And I'll start my comments by reading section three of the governor's order uh, 2123 for amusement parks. Amusement parks may submit a reopening plan to the state of Florida that includes a proposed date for resumption of operation and proposed guidelines to ensure guest staff and safety. Guests and staff safety request to reopen must include an endorsement letter from the county mayor or in the absence of a county mayor, the city mayor and county administrator. The reason why I bring this up and read that is because both of the county offices I spoke to aren't aware of this, uh, both the administrator's office and then they put me through to the CIC. And I'm looking for direction basically, but uh, can't seem to get it. I talked to the city of Clearwater and they referred me back to the CIC. Okay, well, this is the county county administrator on. That's easy, just <laughs> have, call, call my office and, and we'll process that. That's Barry Burton. What I'm looking for, Mr. Burton, is some direction on what you want. I could give you a 100-page document or an a edited version of something that might be a little more user-friendly. Well, I'll, I'll talk to you offline. I, I don't know what I want because the state provided no guidance to us about what we're supposed to be reviewing as part of this process. So, um, okay. I appreciate that. And that's why we're calling you because I'll, that's I'll just be real blunt. Um, so, yeah, we'll figure that out. We, have, we do have one other... Um, water park where I just learned today where the um, the Department of Agriculture said that we must approve their plan also again that's you know I usually hear it from our business owners um, not from state guidance so okay. when I when I did call and speak to them early there yeah, what, what, what they did is um, they they thought you were uh, they considered you an arcade so they said you uh, didn't have to comply with this so that was just a clarification issue happy to work with you on this okay thanks sir okay do we have our other caller back? Uh, yeah, we have two other callers, Madam Chair. Uh, our next speaker is Karen Mullins. Uh, Ms. Mullins, if you give us your first name, last name, spelling, address, and you'll have three minutes to address the board. Karen Mullins, K-A-R-E-N-M-U-L-L-I-N-S, Dunedin, Florida. Uh, thanks for taking the call. My concern is for contact tracing, especially out of the um, local hospitals. Is this something I know we've seen a blip in a couple of hospitals where there have been uh, clusters of COVID and I'm concerned for our community. Is there some way we can do contact tracing on this? Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Cho, do you have a response to that at all? Mm -hmm. Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, so contact tracing, I think I've spoke uh, to this group on, on it before. I think that's one of the key components something that we do. Uh, and if we are seeing clusters within any healthcare facility, hospital, long-term care facility, we do have that um, a capability and it's something that we do uh, routinely. Um, obviously with the, the number of uh, cases that we're seeing, we've had uh, in, enhanced our staffing uh, to do that. Ordinarily, even before the COVID, we had uh, six to eight uh, investigators. We've uh, increased that up to 22 over this response, as well as an additional uh, 18 for contact monitoring. Uh, but again, going back to the, the commenter, um, any uh, increases in clusters within um, hospitals and, and uh, long-term care facilities, we, we do uh, do those investigations. Thank you. Madam Chair, we have one more uh, member of the public that wishes to be heard. Uh, this is someone coming in on the phone line, last four digits, five, six, seven, eight. If you can give us your first and last name, spelling, address, and you'll have three minutes to address the board. My name is Mary LeWarren, L-E-W-A-R-N-E, 209 Third Avenue, Indian Rocks Beach, Florida. Um, I first wanted to um, reiterate 
my thanks to you guys for to the entire commission for getting the um, plan out so quickly to the governor regarding vacation rental reopening. I have a strong financial interest in getting vacation rentals reopened as that is my sole source of income. Um, so this has been an extremely hard time for us financially. Um, my, I have a comment and a question. My comment is regarding the um, plan. I, you know, was concerned when I heard that the governor's office was wanting to limit visitors from certain areas because it harkened me back to the 80s during the AIDS epidemic where we had to, you know, worry about who had AIDS and who didn't. And that ultimately led to us in the healthcare industry um, developing universal precautions. And I just feel like at this point, that's the approach that we are taking is everyone could have COVID. And I think to to assume that, you know, if you're from a certain area or not, that it could, you know, affect your ability to have it or not is dangerous. And so as far as we're concerned in our cleaning protocols, we will assume that anyone, any one of our guests could have had COVID or could have infected our apartments. And I hope that, you know, hotels are doing the same. My question is, is there a preview that we could have for the plan to know what we might need to prepare for or how will you disseminate the plan once it is approved? Thank you, uh, Mr. Burton. It, it, we did uh, post this to our website, so you can go there and see the full plan as, as submitted to the state. And, and we took that off of the uh, guidance documents that were provided. Actually, the um, uh, Short-Term Rental Association was very helpful in kind of copying the CDC guidelines and appropriate procedures. And so we used that as a guide, shared that document amongst several different counties, and came up with the plan that we submitted. Thank you. Okay. Madam Chair, there are no other speakers to be heard on this item. All right. In that case, I will, yes. Just one quick question for Barry. Barry, your plan goes into effect as soon as the state approves it? That's correct. So okay. they can begin taking reservations immediately. Okay. Thank you. And we'll put something out about that. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Uh, I will entertain a motion then. Move approval, Madam Chair. Second. Okay, we have a motion from Commissioner Welch, second from Commissioner Long. All in favor, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. 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 Uh, opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All right, item uh, 13. Item 13 is a grant award um, from the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, this is uh, for $58,600 for COVID related. Um, expenses. Move approval. This is for the homeless population. Right. I have second. a motion to have a second. Thank you. Uh, do we have anyone would like to comment on this? If there are any members of the public that wish to speak on this item, please hit star nine if you're on the telephone or raise your hand virtually in the Zoom application. Mm -hmm. And Madam Chair, there are no members of the public wish to be heard on this item. Okay. Do we have any questions about this? If not, all in favor, please raise your hand. Say aye. 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 Opposed? Opposed? Okay. Item carries 7 0. Okay. Okay. Item 14. Item 14 is a, another grant award from the Depart U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. This is one time funding to support detection and prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of COVID. Uh, this is through the health center. So this uh, with the um, healthcare for the homeless is a co-applicant uh, and this is in the amount of $626,000. Any questions? I'll entertain a motion. Yes, pressure feel. Second. Okay, we have a motion from Commissioner Seal, second from Commissioner Welch. All in favor, say aye. Raise your hand. Aye. aye. Around. Thank you. All right. It is unanimous. Okay. Item 15. This is an interlocal agreement and memorandum of understanding with the Sixth Judicial Circuit Court uh, for county funded uh, employees. Uh, you previously did this from 2009 oh, uh, to 2020. Yeah. This would extend this to where the county can accept the awards and provide personnel in the courts for certain activities. 
Move approval, Madam Chair. Thank you. Do I have a second? Uh, do we have anyone who would like to speak to this? At this time, if there are any members of the public that wish to speak on this agenda item, please hit star nine on the phone or raise your hand virtually in the Zoom application. And Madam Chair, there are no members of the public which should be heard on this item. Okay, any questions? All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries 7-0, item 16. This is a resolution approving a substantial amendment to the annual action plan. Uh, this provides two sets of funding. Um, so this would the, the county will receive $1.4 million uh, related uh, to for uh, low and moderate income and then $739,000 with for ESG. So we need to go out for um, application for people to submit. This will make start the plan amendment process simultaneously. Bruce sent you kind of a timeline uh, for this process previously, and so we're asked for your approval. Thank you. Madam Do you have Chair, any questions? I'm so sorry to interrupt, Madam Chair, but on the last vote, who was the second? We, I, we didn't get that as far as the uh, well, oh. Thank you. Sorry. Do we have any questions on item 16? If not, I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Commissioner Welch, second by Commissioner Seal. Okay. All in favor, please say aye. Oh, did we? Public comment. Do we have any comments? At this time, if there are any members of the public that wish to comment on agenda item number 16, uh, please raise your hand virtually in the Zoom meeting or hit star nine if you're on the telephone. And Madam Chair, there are no members of the public that wish to be heard. Okay. That being the case, all in favor say aye. Aye. Raise your hand. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. Item 17. This is supplement one, uh, number one to the county incentive grant program through the Florida Department of Transportation. Uh, the result, the reason for this is that projects were done as part of a different project. And so this agreement for this project needs to be reduced. The original amount was $2 million. It needs to be reduced down to $806,000 as a result of the project being done through a different project. Hmm. Move okay. approval, Madam Chair. Thank you. Do we have a second? <clears throat> what? I'll second it. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Peters, um, do we have any questions? All right. Uh, do we have any comments? At this time, if there are any members of the public that wish to comment on agenda item 17, uh, please raise your hand virtually in the Zoom meeting or hit star nine on the telephone. And Madam Chair, there are no members of the public that wish to be heard for this item. Okay, that being the case, all in favor say aye. Raise aye. your hand. Aye. Thank you, motion carries unanimously. Okay, item 18. Uh, Madam Chair, item 18 needs to be deferred to the um, June 26th agenda. Then amendment has not yet have been signed by the other party. Okay. Is that something we need to do something about, Madam Attorney? Okay. Okay, item 19. Renewal of certificates of public convenience for a non-medical wheelchair transport and stretcher van provider. Move approval, Move Madam approval. Chair. Okay. Um, we have a motion from Commissioner Long, second from Commissioner Justice. Do we have any comments from citizens? At this time, if there are any members of the public that wish to comment on, on agenda item number 19, please raise your hand virtually in the Zoom meeting or hit star nine on the telephone. Madam Chair, there are no members of the public that wish to be heard on this item. All right, questions from the board? Not all in favor say aye. Raise your hand. Okay. Thank you. Item, or, yeah, item passes unanimously. Item 20, Madam Attorney. 
Um, Madam Chair, under item number 20, I'm asking for your approval for my office to initiate litigation in the referenced case. This is a code enforcement matter where the uh, defendant has been given an opportunity and to, co to come into compliance and has not. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. I'll entertain a motion. Thank you. Commissioner Peters, do I have a second? Second. Mind you guys can't go to sleep yet. Um, we don't take comment on attorney's issues, do we? Now, I, I would suggest since you're voting, you go ahead and open it up for comment. Do we have any comments? At this time, if there are any members of the public that wish to comment on agenda item number 20, uh, please raise your hand virtually in the Zoom application or hit star nine on your phone. And Madam Chair, there are no members of the public that wish to speak on this item. I guess it would be hard anyway. Um, <laughs> there are any, all right. That being the case, all in favor say aye. Raise your hand, please. Thank you. Okay, motion carries unanimously. That was Commissioners Peter and Peters and Long. Um, all right. Madam Attorney, do you have anything else? I would like to share with the board um, yesterday. We were provided a copy of a new complaint that has been filed against the county that is related to uh, COVID-19 in our response. We are co-defendants with the state of Florida. This has been filed by a bar who is seeking uh, basically a mandatory injunction to compel us to let them reopen. Okay. I would note Great. at this time the order in place that is preventing them from reopening is the state order. Thank you. Okay. Well, we won't worry about that too much then. And All it right. will appear through the normal course on a future agenda. I just wanted to bring it to your attention at this point. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Administrator. Uh, two items. Um, the first item is the CARES update. And so I'd ask Mike Midell and Daisy Rodriguez and, and Lourdes to uh, provide an update. So we'll just start with Mike on the business side uh, and Daisy. I will tell you, they're going to give you that update. One of the things I want to highlight is uh, just on the processing, processing of these applications, we got about 50 staff dedicated uh, full time working on these. It's just, you know, even under this revised process, I only say that because we're also working on looking at how we would do a phase two. And it's very important. We're going to be reaching out to many community members, and I, I can't thank people enough. Um, there's been a lot of people volunteered to, to meet with us, share their ideas, and so we're organizing ourselves. We had a, a meeting earlier today. Um, regarding that outreach. And so we're going to be doing that very shortly um, and beginning that process to bring back to you recommendations on what a phase two would look like. But just beginning to do that outreach, there's been a lot of people share ideas and we really do appreciate that. Um, but it's a significant undertaking. And so um, I'll turn it over to Mike and to Daisy, kind of highlight where we're at and the issues that we're involved and uh, where we're going with this. Who's first? Okay. Um, so uh, I guess I'll go ahead and go first. Daisy. Everyone, can, everyone can hear me okay? Yep. All right. Um, so the statistics, statistics that I want to share with you is from when we launched on April 30th through Sunday, May 17th. Um, we meet every single evening via conference call with 211 to look at uh, how things are flowing, process, and operations. So as of the Sunday, the 17th, we have completed, they have completed and closed 131 cases for a total amount of $146,887. Currently in progress, there are 641 cases in progress with an estimated value payout of $818,630. Uh, we've done extensive outreach, um, shared broadly in the community through our community stakeholders, our work groups. We've included the flyer um, through our work groups and have been talking about it uh, consistently every time we meet on a weekly basis. I've also shared with the Homeless Leadership Alliance, with the Providers Council, with the System of Care. Um, there's the Behavioral Health Strategy Meeting that took place yesterday with all of the behavioral health providers. I believe there were more than 50 providers on there. We talked about the CARES uh, financial assistance for individuals and families, as well as sending it out to the community health center. So I, I sent that out to Edward Kutcher as well. Um, 
I think that uh, the, the two messages that we really want to get out that are significant and really important is, once again, we want to encourage people to text COVID CARES to 898-211. It is the fastest and most expeditious way to submit your documents. It walks you through the process up until the point where it allows you and provides you with the email address to submit all your documents. One of the challenges we have been having or 211 has been having is associated with individuals who are submitting portions of documents that are required and not submitting everything at once. So we ask the public that as you're submitting and requesting for financial assistance, please help us help you, help us help expedite the process by submitting all of the required documents at one time. Uh, when I met with and spoke with all of our community stakeholders, I've also asked them that as they're meeting with clients who might be eligible to help them gather all of their documents and to really be that conduit to help them um, upload everything in a succinct and uh, uniformed matter because that certainly will help 211 process those applications a lot faster. So once again, it's, um, you know, certainly if people are not comfortable with using technology, don't have access to it, uh, they can call 211, but the fastest way to get through the process and upload all of your documents at one time, we ask you again, is text COVID CARES to 898-211. Okay. And is there a place where they can consult ahead of time what documents they're going to need? Sure. So if if, if if when you go through the um, when you go through the texting module, it does it does prompt you with those questions. And if you call in, we have uh, twenty nine county staff members. Um, half of them are devoted to answering the phone calls, and they will provide that information to them. And they can always go on the website as well. Okay. So it does list them on the website. Yes, it does. And they can take a picture of it on their phone and just send something That's like that. As long as it's legible. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank uh, you. Yes. Mike. Yes. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Um, just want to give you a quick update on our Pinellas Care Small Business Grant Program. As of last night, we had over 3,700 applications that have been submitted by small businesses. 987 of those have been touched in some form by county staff. Uh, that's about 26% of, a little over 26% of all of those that have been submitted. As of today, uh, 307 checks have gone out to businesses, totaling over $1.5 million. Um, our primary goal was to make it a, a simple process for small businesses to apply for the grant. And we definitely succeeded in that. In the first day, 1,500 uh, applications were submitted. Um, we've had touched at this point about two thirds of that first day's set of applications. And over a thousand more are uh, in some stage of being prepared for submission by applicants at this time. We have 50 staff from multiple county departments working on review of these, plus 16 more at the clerk's office that are doing the auditing function, and another three at the inspector general's office doing fraud prevention. And all of these are working at least full time on the project, and many are working overtime. As of this morning, we've touched, as I mentioned, over 1,000 cases, and 173 have been denied. 85% of all the cases that we have worked so far have required some kind of follow-up with the applicant. So this is an intensive process. It's difficult and time-consuming, and uh, we appreciate the staff that are going through that. We've done a quick review of all of the applications that have been submitted that haven't been touched yet and have identified about 400 of those that are pretty clearly going to be denied based on the type of business not being eligible under the program. But even with that, we have a, you know, a long time ahead of us. In fact, we are probably looking at, um, we'll be closing applications on June the 1st. It'll probably take the rest of June for us to clear that backlog and address everybody who is in the, uh, in the queue right now and could be over the next couple of weeks. Um, outreach, we sent out over 14,000 emails directly to businesses and chambers of commerce uh, to help launch the program. There have been 135,000 uh, social media impressions 
out there thanks to our marketing and communications department. We've done Facebook live events to describe the program. We've done TV and podcast interviews. Um, planning another outreach uh, in these last two weeks to help businesses to, uh, in particular, to, um, to do a better job of, of providing the right documentation. People have been providing documentation. It just hasn't always matched up correctly with the uh, proper format uh, for their business uh, corporation type. So we're gonna emphasize that in the next round of communications. Um, with that, that brings you up to speed on where we are. A question about one of those. We got an email probably a week or two now from a business that was denied because they were because they were serving a business that was considered essential, but their business had been pretty much devastated. Yeah. Right. So I, I'm wondering where the criteria comes from and how are we interpreting those things that in essence, we close down as a county those things that the governor says, I never closed down a business. Right. <laughs> yes. But we effectively did. And yeah, so I'm we, wondering how that, how all that fits into what sure. we're doing. I, I guess I, in general, though, I have to say I'm, I was wishing that things would move a lot faster. So I don't know if we're putting a lot more obstacles in the way of people getting this money or what, but we actually said there was going to be, people were going to have money in their hands in what, a couple of weeks? Two well, to three weeks. And commissioners, oh. one, and I'll let Mike finish on that because on that particular point, that is a home-based business that, um, that was impacted out. And so when we set the criteria, we set it up uh, very, you know, uh, strictly for, you know, um, brick and mortar type business. Um, because it was easy to verify. One of the things is under this, we have audit requirements. And so Ken Burke was part of establishing the criteria and how we would conduct that program um, because we have to have documentation. We can't just say you were impacted and hand out a check. Um, now, but, but it also goes to the complexity of how many staff people, I only kind of gave you that because we're gonna talk about phase two and we're gonna talk about home-based businesses. Um, and, and, and a physical right. business, I have a location on versus a home-based business and trying to have documentation to know the legitimacy or not of that and the audit process. It's going to be much more complex. So that's the reason we wanted to get this first round out while we prepare the criteria and have that discussion for a much more broad program. Um, but Mike can answer specifics about that particular program and some of the issues and challenges that they're having on getting these checks out quickly which was the whole intent of the program. Right, All right. Yeah, no, exactly. And uh, keep in mind that the first date that we began working with, uh, with applications was May the 4th. And so we are near that uh, two to three week range, three week range now, we're not quite there yet. And uh, we have gotten out quite a few checks, but we're, uh, we're in the process. And a lot of that is due to the complexity of the, um, of filling out the W-9 form in particular that the clerk requires in order to make a check. And unfortunately, it's hard to explain people based on their type of business exactly how to complete that form. And it requires a lot of handholding, more than we thought. So we're gonna focus our, our, our education on that. But in general, the guidelines were set up based upon the governor's executive order and your safer at home order. And then all of the, the uh, sheets that were used by the sheriff's tip line to help identify which businesses had to close as a result of those orders. So we compare all of our um, determinations to those original orders. And there's, uh, when you add in all the executive governor orders and all of the versions of Safer at Home, there's about 12 different documents that were source documents for this. And it's designed really to uh, help everyone who was uh, significantly impacted by a closure ordered by the governor or by the Board of County Commissioners. So that they have to be directly impacted. The business you're talking about has their customers directly impacted, but they are listed as a wholesaler, which in the governor's orders is an, uh, an essential business and allowed to continue to operate because they were not touching uh, retail customers. They were only responding to the orders filled by business. Uh, unfortunately, those businesses were all closed. 
So what we want to look at in phase two is those secondary effects, people who sell to people who couldn't be open. Or expanding, the criteria, expanding that criteria in terms of who would be right. eligible and what that would be. And if you recall back, it's limited to $5,000. So this is not the federal PPP program where it's actually giving people money to replace the lost income. This was, you know, a little bit of money, let them pay the rent, you know, keep the utilities lights on. It's, it's a little bit of seed money while they got to larger programs. Uh, never really designed about loss of income. I can't use that for loss of income. Um, and so there's it's, it's a little bit different design in the program. But again, all those things that we're, I've heard concerns about, staff's looking at those and trying to frame that out for a discussion around phase two and then apply the criteria for eligibility um, that is provided by the federal government on the use of these funds and the audit procedure. And then finally, we have to look at the staff capability of processing, you know, gearing up for, you know, what, what could be a, a more burdensome review process. Um, so we have to be fully cognizant of that. And we're gonna be bringing back to you some recommendations on that program uh, shortly. Hopefully that'll be part, some of that will be to streamline the system a little bit. I think in both cases for the, the individual and the business, because you know, the longer it goes, the less important that money becomes. You've and, either and I do, done and, and I do, or you've starved, or you know, you've borrowed money somewhere else. I, I'm just saying that and, even though it's a small amount of money, it can be very important in that moment. And it, if, if there's any way for us to speed up the process, well, and it's and it's just like over on the two one one. Most of the reasons that checks have failed to cut is because they haven't provided the documentation. As soon as we get the documentation and get verification, we can cut the check. And, and and that's a cumbersome process. Some people have problems with you know loading that. We've heard those. And so we've, we've talked about how to have community partners and others that can help people. So I think there's definitely some lessons learned out of this. And we need to make that um, 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 as easy as possible. Um, but we do have to have that audit process as part of this review. Um, but we, we, again, we're going to bring back to you and we're going to look at any lessons learned and, and even potentially outsourcing, you know, the processing of this. So maybe that's something we have to look at. I, I don't know. Um, but we certainly need to be able to uh, uh, deliver on the results that you expect. Okay. Yes, Commissioner Eggers. Well, when we when we started this thing two weeks ago, um, I remember hearing the number 170 million dollars in phase one would be about 30 to 35 million for residential, 30 to 35 million for commercial. We'd take applications for the month and then we would be talking about phase two. Um, and so the numbers that I'm hearing are we're not, we're not going to get anywhere close to that 60 or 70 million dollar number. Right. Uh, for phase one. Did I hear all that correctly? Well, you, or? you got over you got over half. So we, we had a total of 6,500 businesses that would have been eligible for on the business side. And I think you've got 3,800 or Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, something like that, that you have um, request in for that have yet to process. So you're probably about halfway there on the business side. Um, the On the individual side, it has been very slow. The, the, the concern with the individual side is I re, we really had no idea how many people would apply. Um, and so it's much more hard to judge that. Um, and we, you know, so that's, I think that's the area that we, we've struggled with because they've done, you heard the outreach, but yeah, that, that we haven't had the applications that we thought we might have. Yeah, so so I know there's been some discussion. Has there been any more thought about uh, kind of reversing the, the 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 playing field and finding out from the utility companies and or the the um, you know where people are behind on and kind of filling it backwards because we certainly have lists. I'm sure you can call Duke Energy and find out who has had who's who's not paying, who can't pay. Um, and I know we can't do with the mortgages. There's no way to find out all of those. But um, I'm, it just surprises me. It, it, it actually shocks me that we don't have more folks at the table. This is, I mean, and, and unless we just completely have misread the, you know, uh, our our county. So I, I'm, I'm, I, I just don't think we. And again, I appreciate everything that's been done, but I think it is cumbersome. I think it is unwieldy for a lot of people. And um, 
whatever we can do to, to expedite that imp improvement. Again, it's easy to criticize. What's the answer? Well, maybe we have some, you know, we have those, uh, those, those open seminars where we have uh, people that are trying to uh, hire people for companies and they have like a, a session on a Saturday where people come in and they talk to all the different companies. Well, maybe we ought to have something like that. Maybe we already done that. But um, we have uh, to be sit, to be sitting on this kind of money and not being able to use it just goes against what we're what we've been talking about, and it's extremely frustrating. Um, are we in phase two looking at revisiting those that were in phase one again? Um, is that on the table for discussion as well? Oh, oh yeah. I mean, we're, we're going to learn out you know what we have out of phase one, but you know you you heard. I mean, we have you know nine hundred thousand people in this county, and and. We had no idea how many people would be applying under the individual assistance on this. There was no way to get that number. Uh, Marketing Communications, Daisy and her group have reached out to every organization and partner agency to push this out. And um, and so, yeah, I, I hear um, because we were really trying to get people to give give them that little uh, little extra funding to be able to or, or they could get to to the state unemployment system, you know, yeah. or things like that. But we just haven't seen those numbers. So. Um, we're, they're continuing to push that out. They're not stopping. And we still have until June 1. And so um, as the partner agencies and all of the different organizations that they work with daily uh, that work with uh, people in need, um, they'll continue to push that out and um, see who uh, is in need of assistance through these two programs. Yeah, I think some of the criteria that we came up with uh, arbitrary, but still, I know we wanted to make sure that we had enough money in that first phase. But um, there's a lot of new businesses uh, that were affected dramatically since October, November one. They've been in business, and they've not. They don't qualify, um, and they're probably ready. To, they need help too. And of course, yep. they're not in. They're not in phase one. Right. Um, and um, and there are a lot of as we said, but there's a lot of those situations out there that we've kind of set up because we really didn't have a good feel for the residential side, uh, or not. You know, the, the our individual two one one side. And so um, uh, I'm assuming we're, we're when are you going to bring us back that next phase? Uh, are we waiting until the second uh, the commission meeting? No, in June? We, so we had a staff meeting on it this morning. OK, and we reviewed kind of the criteria. What we also reviewed was, you know, who are we seeking input from? Um, and so we discussed that. We've had a lot of um, community uh, volunteers uh, and organizations volunteer. And so we're going to. We're going to do some outreach. We're going to talk to some key leaders in terms of making sure that we're talking to the right people. And we're going to then probably do a more broad community survey. It makes it harder, you know, if we could do if we could do uh, three or four public meetings, you know, and invite groups in and get their feedback. It'd be a lot easier. But that's not the day that we're in. So we're going to try to have some modified processes. We can do things like this. We can do uh, surveys um, and, and gather ideas. Uh, and then we can talk to key individuals and organizations uh, that have offered up ideas of how to make this fair, how to make sure we're including all segments of our population and uh, different types of organizations. So our intent is to do that over the next couple of weeks. Well, as we do that, then we'll refine down uh, the type of program that we're looking at, and then we'll bring it in for you. And then at that time, obviously, then people would have another shot at um, you know telling you their thoughts. We put that out publicly, let people give you their ideas before we finalize that final criteria. And that way we could have a program up and running for phase two in late June. One final question. Um, do we have a time frame, a time limit on, on, on utilizing the funds uh, before we ha uh, have to send it back? And end of this year. End of this calendar year? Calendar year. And, and here's the other, the other piece to this, because we're going to talk about this when we talk about phase two, but I'll go ahead and give you a teaser. Um, you know, what happens if we have a um, an outbreak this fall, you know, October, November? Um, do we want to, um, you know, have some money set aside to be able to address, you know, any issues at that time? So those, so we're going to have a discussion about all of that. But yeah, we have to use them by the end of this year. So you can, you can reserve money. Um, we if, could. Uh, it, 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 whether we do, whether we do it or the, uh, we do it in conjunction with our cities who are going through the same things that we're doing. Yeah, absolutely. And we're going to be talking. That's the cities are, are one of the partner groups that we want to reach out to. But remember, this cannot be used to supplement loss of income. So my sales tax is down. We can't use 
you know, the, this to supplement, um, you know, revenue losses. And so we have to, it has to be direct impact as a, a direct cost as a result of COVID. I understand. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Seal. Uh, yes, um, I think Commissioner Eggers asked a lot of the questions that I asked and maybe expressed some frustrations as well. But I've heard some really from the business end of things. I've heard some uh, positive feedback. So I did want to um, say that where they thought the process, if, if you were a small business owner, you would have all the documents at hand because you would need them on a regular basis. So they um, we did receive a nice a few nice compliments. Um, so phase two, I know Commissioner, Commissioner um, Gerard mentioned the not-for-profits and I didn't hear that again today, but I just, uh -huh. from a sheer volume, um, you know, we have 4,550 not-for-profits that generate more than $7 billion. So it is a large industry and I do hope that we um, address that. And the, um, so, you hinted at phase two, but is there a time period that we are targeting that we will launch phase two? Thank you. Well, we're not going to, the program, the, the current program closes June 1st. So we're going to start seeking input literally this week. Um, and we're going to be using Aubrey. She's the master facilitator. And so uh, she's volunteered again um, and, and to help us with this. And um and we're going to be reaching out to organizations again we want to bring to you in early june uh, kind of right after the budget discussions um the and or maybe in between the budget discuss somewhere through there um program criteria and in the form of a program that we can have discussions to get your input on and then finalize that and have that ready to go at the end of june would be a tentative timeline and we've heard, just so you know, we've heard about cities, individuals, social service agencies, religious and faith-based, counties, um, you know, chambers of commerce, um, community advancement, you know, uh, organizations like One Community, um, and, you know, Foundation for Healthy St. Pete, many, many, many others. So we, we're, we're collecting um, all the different organizations and we'll be formulating a process to do that outreach. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Welch. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, most of the questions have been answered, but I just want to, again, th staff has done a great job on this. Uh, it's barely been two weeks and we've helped a whole lot of folks. Um, and I'm more comfortable on the business side. I want to make sure I had some of these numbers correct. Uh, Mike said there were 3,700, around 3,700 apps submitted. And then yeah. Mike, did I hear you say later that a thousand more are being prepared? Yeah, there are a thousand in the queue. Now, some of those may have been abandoned and they decided on their own that they weren't eligible, but uh, there's a thousand applications in some process of being submitted, but they have not yet hit that button and said, I'm submitting it. Okay, that's in addition to the 3,700. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, as Barry said, we're almost, you know, if you count that thousand, almost at the 5,000 that we estimated, 4,700. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think when you get the, in phase two, when you look at the, the home base, I think on the on the business side, we're gonna basically be there. And like Commissioner Seal said, I did hear from a couple of companies where this was a lifesaver and they were waiting for it. And, uh, you know, two weeks in, we've got 300 checks out the door and, you know, it's been probably more intensive than y'all thought it would be. Yeah. Uh, thanks wow. for that, that work. On the individual side, I think it was, I think there are a number of things. The private sector has kind of stepped up and given some some relief to folks on their mortgages and uh, utility companies have said, you know, like the city of St. Pete, if you're late on your water bill, they're not going to shut down. So I think a lot of that has played into it. And the fact that we're not funding uh, food services, uh, I think that's a big piece of what folks are looking for. I rode my bike this Saturday and folks still lining up at the TROP uh, for uh, uh, feeding Tampa Bay. So I, I think just the way it was structured, that's why that number on the individual side is lower, just in my opinion. I did want to ask uh, Daisy on the, she said, I think you said 131 cases. Daisy have been processed completely. That's correct, sir. And that was about $130,000. 
one four six. Yes. Okay. Do you have any uh, like a breakdown of what most of those payments were for? The rent and utilities. But was it on the rent side or utilities, or do you not have? Uh, that? On the rentals, on the rent side is higher. Okay. Okay. Well, again, I think y'all are doing a great job, and um, you know, I just think there's so much help on the individual side. I think that's why that number is a little bit lower than I thought it would be. But Commissioner, uh, on the CDBG funding that you just approved, the mm -hmm. focus is on food. And that was the the one point five. Yeah, the one point. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you. I think y'all are doing a great job on this. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Anything else on that? Okay. Uh, mitigation and parks. Uh, yes. So there was a question regarding um, some recent controlled um, um, cleaning at our parks, and I'm not going to use the terms. I'll let Paul Kazi uh, do that. He's also going to share with you what they were doing and um, how they, they've done this in the past and why they were doing it. So I'll let Paul go. Good afternoon again, commissioners. Um, just to be brief, um, I, I hope you've all had an opportunity to review the report, but the uh, activity that's been taking place at several of our regional parks uh, is known as, uh, under many names, mechanical mowing, mechanical mulching, mechanical thinning. Uh, the purpose of that activity is to reduce fuel loads as well as improve the health and sustainability of our natural areas in the parks. Uh, we recently completed uh, 60 acres uh, amongst four different parks, uh, War Veterans, Walsingham, Boca Ciega, and Lake Seminole Parks. Um, admittedly, we weren't expecting the, uh, uh, the reaction um, from some of our park patrons. I think uh, um, without having a full understanding of the purpose of the activity, and the benefits of the activity that can be expected. So uh, definitely a lesson learned there and we hope to do more in the way of education uh, to that end. But um, um, as I mentioned in the report and, and the cover memo, certainly this is not something uh, that's a destructive activity. I know um, some people viewed it that way, but uh, it is necessary for the long-term health of those areas and and as i said earlier most importantly to reduce the uh the fire danger uh, i think in the there's a picture in the report of a fire we had in march of 2016 at walsingham park that quickly covered about 15 acres um in in really less than an hour's time and um, if we didn't have uh, that long parking lot between the lake and our uh, picnic shelters. Uh, on that date, I was there, we had the potential to have uh, loss of fire structures as well as uh, several personal vehicles that, um, that roared through there. And of course, if you've been out there at Walsingham Park in particular, you'll see a number of dead uh, pine trees, and that is the result of these fuels, particularly palmettos, getting up so high that when we do have a fire, um, the heat, it's kind of like holding your hand over, over the stove. You know, if you hold it 12 inches above, you're not going to get burned, but if you bring it down to six inches, you're going to feel it, and that's what happens with those trees. Once they get scorched, you've got dead pine trees, and then we've lost what is really uh, what those lands are being managed for. So if you have any questions, um, certainly be open to providing you any answers I can. Yes, Commissioner Long, did you have something? Yes, I did, Paul, and thank you for that report, which is helpful, but it still doesn't take away the awful look of it. And my question is, how long will it be before that whole area that you've done begins to look beautiful again? I mean, it's so awful looking. Um, it will begin to green up in, in a matter of weeks or months um, if we get our normal summer rains. Um, 
I would anticipate, and this is probably not the news that you want to hear, but probably within three to five years, um, we will have to do some type of mitigation work out there uh, because it will look like it did when where we've got 10, 10 foot high palmettos that are just not sustainable to keep in that environment without having fear of catastrophic losses or catastrophic damage, not only to the park natural areas, but uh, to, to neighbors as well. Um, if we have a fire uh, that gets away from us because we have too much fuel, um, it's dangerous for for everyone. That's why we manage those properties in that in that regard. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. That's all I had. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate the explanation for the public. Um, maybe next time we do this program, we can have some educational signs up ahead of time. We're going to do this, and this is why. Because yeah, people got really upset. Yes, they love they love their parks. They love their parks. Mm -hmm. That's a good thing. Okay. Madam Chair, that's all I have. All right. Does anybody have any new business? Yes, Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Madam Chair. Not really new business. I did want to share with you that um, as part of the COVID, the Area Agency on Aging did receive a grant and have partnered with about a dozen area restaurants and I've been uh, buying meals from those restaurants. So it's been helping them survive a little bit, but also delivering them uh, those meals to seniors. And just last week, 18,000 meals uh, were delivered to seniors uh, that were impacted. So uh, Anne Marie and her team are doing really good stuff out there. I just wanted to share that with the commission. That's very cool. Thank you. Commissioner Long. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I just have two things that I wanted to, first of all, congratulate Julie Marcus for her inter yes. interim appointment yes. as supervisor of election. It's just so nice to know there'll be someone there who really ha has a handle on dotting the I's and crossing the T's. So I appreciate that. Thank you. And also I wanted to send a heartfelt thank you to the sheriff for the opportunity to tour the beaches by air this last weekend. It surely gives you a uh, very different perspective from to see that when you're making decisions number one and it also brings right up to you the importance of our hurricane planning as you become so aware of the voluminous amounts of water that surround our beautiful county so um i really appreciated that and it was very very helpful thank you that's all thank you madam chair Thank you. Commissioner Welch. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to again thank our staff and all our partners for being so flexible and uh, able to quickly adapt to changes at the state level. And Barry, y'all have done an excellent job and Sheriff and all the partners. Uh, and also wanted to um, I congratulate Julie Marcus as well. Uh, a very wise decision by the governor on that appointment. Uh, and that's all I have. Thank you. Okay, Commissioner Seal. I'll echo um, <clears throat> all of the comments already made, but um, congratulations also to Julie Marcus, but um, I will be sending you all the t and meeting highlights by email so that you have those. And um, also um, just um, everybody have a safe Memorial Day weekend out to the public, um, please use your social distancing, your mask if necessary, and um, I'm glad you're supporting our economy and, and open back up our county. So uh, thank you all very much. Thank you. And uh, Gary, I was just wondering if we could, I know we have full schedules for the next few meetings, but um, if we could have a little presentation about um, hurricane preparedness in the COVID age. We've had some questions about that. Like, what are we gonna do about shelters and all that? So I know you guys have been busy, but 
No, they're right. they're right actually around the corner. That. I know they're working on it, but okay. And and um, yeah, Kathy's Kathy's actually given a couple of presentations on that. Some of that right. is a work in progress. You know, this okay. is a uh, this is changing all the plans. So yeah, um, I, I think us and the state are dealing with that. But we'd happy we'd be happy to provide an update and kind of the, her thoughts and uh, some of the changes that are occurring as a result of the new environment we're living in. Okay, thanks, uh, Commissioner Eggers. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I also wanted to uh, congratulate Julie for the appointment. I think it was well deserved. Uh, she is certainly all on top of the, the, what it takes to do that job right. And I really just think that the uh, the staff will be well served, as will the residents of Pinellas County. I wanted to thank and congratulate the Sheriff's Office, uh, Barry, all of your folks over the last few weeks. Of, I mean, well, actually, it's the last eight weeks, but really the last two weeks is if people are getting it more tired and Mm -hmm. um and stretched um they keep delivering um and you know sometimes i pick up you know I'll, I'll pick at some things and i think to myself my gosh am i being too critical and i don't mean to be but they've really been amazing um and they're such professionals and i really all of the separate task forces that you have that are in place trying to anticipate the next issues that we have to deal with um just a great great thing and just and the other thing i was just going to say to our residents who have been been amazing the first couple of months. Continue to be amazing and be respectful. This is going to be a, a really, really, really busy weekend. Um, and just uh, be safe. And as, as Commissioner Seal said, I'm so glad that you're supporting um, our businesses out there, but just be careful as you do it. Uh, you know, I was thinking about your comment about the sidewalks. Uh, the trails themselves are just jammed. And um, and you know, we just have to be careful. Bike riders, you can't do what you normally do. You know, you have to kind of slow down and give give a little room. So, um, and then the last thing I was going to say is um, I had a chance to uh, uh, virtually meet with FIXA directors uh, yesterday. Gosh, the weeks the weeks just amazing. Uh, I think it was yesterday. It could have been the day before. Anyway, really good meeting. Uh, they're preparing for a June one opening at the at the libraries, um, and. Um, at uh, the Palm Harbor Community Center. Uh, a lot of work is going in to make it safe. Um, they're obviously, you know, uh, getting getting the sites ready. Uh, mostly uh, they have limitations on the numbers. The libraries are gonna be limited to 50 and 20 between Palm Harbor and East Lake at a time. Um, you'll be people waiting outside to get in. They're gonna try to limit the amount of time in, in Palm Harbor that you can be in the library so that we can give everybody a chance. They've got a really good programs put together. They have a little bit different twists on, on sanitizing and taking care of the facility, but they're really we're preparing, preparing well. And um, I know that um, there's a lot of effort going into the summer programs for, the, for recreation and um, just uh, amazing the amount of work that goes on. I know Erica has some issues that she's dealing with in terms of the number of kids in a, particular, in a room. Uh, mm -hmm. She's working through that with, uh, with our staff, but... Uh, and then we have the uh, you know East Lake uh, recreation that has been pretty much shut down, and they're thinking about like opening it so people can get on there and and just practice a little bit, not necessarily engage in competition, but we only have one person out there, so it's a little bit different than than Erica's um, uh, the, the recreation program over in uh, Palm Harbor. But um, they're really doing good work out there, and and I think you'd be very proud of them. I know the residents uh, will be as well when they get into their facilities. So. I just want to uh, take my hat off to them. And uh, with that, Madam Chair, I have nothing else. And have a safe Memorial Day weekend, everybody. Same to you and everyone. And if there's nothing else, we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.